So I'm going to start by just giving a small bit of context before we begin. Uh, this weather story um, sort of emerged out of um, the research project um, that, uh, that I was doing this summer um, in that um, I met Kim and uh, Kim and I exchanged um, letters starting August 25th um, until October 20th uh, while I was in Ontario and Kim was in Yukon and BC. So throughout this um, story, my words are rendered in Kim's voice and vice versa. So um, this story is uh, called Dear Friend. A weather report in letters. London, Ontario, 25th of August, 2022. Dear Kim, let me start by describing the light. It feels very high in the sky, as if the sky is a dome lined with some kind of reflective material. Everything seems wide and open. I wouldn't describe it as bright exactly. Perhaps buoyant, elevated, floating. Klondike Valley, Yukon. Dear Kate, I have been struck by how different the greenhouse plants look in different light. You would know this thinking of photography. The tomato plant in lush blue-green health on this gray day can look paltry and pale in full sun. I imagine an old washed out postcard or silent film. The clouds. Are they even moving? I love the cloudscape view from my friend's second story condo where I stay. It's a small space inside made expansive by the sky and the always changing painting of cloud on sky. They seem stuck, painted on. Their edges are lined with a white so bright it glows, but their bodies are the same color as the sky. They rise like gray-blue plumes of smoke above the bright red-sided building across the street. Blue skies, gray skies, pink skies. That must speak to the multiplicity of our experiences of the sky. There is only one, right? It is a typical late summer day in southwestern Ontario. I remember these days well from when I was a child. The dog days of summer, so hot, so humid, so close. Cicadas buzzing loudly, the earth drying, the grass browning, the leaves crisping at the edges, everything thirsty and slow. It's gray here today. The hill across the river, visible from the south window of the bedroom, is shrouded in mist. Or maybe it's fog. Or low cloud. I'm never sure what the difference is, or how to tell when one bleeds into the other. I suppose, like so many of our words, it's the words themselves that create the boundary, or need for it. The clouds are likely ambivalent. Outside, the sidewalks and streets are busy. Yesterday, the weather was odd and changeable. The air was thick and drowsy. These days feel long and heavy, but signal a coming change. Mornings like this feel like waiting. Actually, so do fogged in ones. Though they are cozy, there is a sense of anticipation of the grand reveal when the trees, then the hills, then the sky become visible, washed in sunlight. The nights have been cooling for a few weeks now, but the days have stayed summery. 
Today, though, the temperature dropped to 13 degrees centigrade and we scrambled to find pants and sweaters. 17th of September, 2022. Dear Kate. Dear Kim, I am working in a cafe today. It was a tomato sauce day. The wood tables are closely set. Bits of conversation cut through the general rumble of background noise. A jam day. I'm thinking through the next stage of our project. A blanching and freezing day. As researchers, we are interested in historicizing human soil relations. As farmers, this time of year, it often feels like a race against the weather. With the aim of understanding how soils objectification, the weather is compelling, and commodification, it's driving, contributed to and is embedded within unequal social relations. It defines what we do in so many ways. I'm wondering how exactly this fits with the concerns raised by the Yukon farming community. What would it look like if everyone, all our systems, responded to the weather, allowed themselves to be driven by it? Adapt to a change in climate? Encourage a new wave of young farmers? Figure out how to be economically viable while modeling good relations with the land. 22nd of September, 2022. Dear Kim, the leaves have just barely started. A few yellows here and there. Dear Kate, did I tell you the apples are coloring up? Greens in the sun are luminescent. Those in the shade, richly hued. Red and green are poor words for the shades of pink, fuchsia, crimson, and sunshine yellow that festoon the trees. Over the next few weeks, we'll see the reds and oranges. Crimson, scarlet, rust, burnt orange, amber, sienna. A beautiful mosaic of warmth and decay. I love the color of autumn skies when they edge toward cobalt, birch leaves flushing deep yellow. I drove through the country last week. I was surprised to find the leaves had already started changing while in the city, they were still green. I hope we get that later today. I wonder why. This dullness does nothing for my mood. Seventh of October, twenty twenty two. Dear Kim, dear Kate, let me start by describing the light that familiar green black that inspires a bit of awe, a bit of fear. Rain coursing onto and over a roof, especially a tin one, transports me to a place of safety and comfort I rarely feel on a quiet night. The rains came fast and hard, sometimes torrentially, always straight down, hammering the earth. So cozy inside, even with the knowledge that some work has now become impossible. I was inside most of the day, working on a grant application. I was largely unaffected, except for when the rains brought me abruptly out of my head and into the world. I laugh, though did I not take refuge in my computer yesterday, recalling an intern from Vancouver Island who never batted an eyelash, suiting up and carrying on, come rain, hail, drizzle, or downpour. I was compelled to move my gaze from the screen to the window each time lightning shot through the sky to the south, chasing itself and illuminating the clouds like a light box does a negative. Do you get sheet lightning in Dawson? I rarely see lightning of any sort, not directly. Thunder, lots of thunder and flashes that light up windows, but not so I can tell more than a general direction. 
Rain here is almost always cold. Storms, dangerous. Today's rain is decidedly crisper. They call for cover and vigilance. Turn off the breaker for the solar panels. Watch for trees that might go over. Drops pelt my office window, large and unforgiving. Marbles hitting a tile floor. Check that the greenhouses are secured and the hatches battened. Did I mention I haven't spent much time outdoors? Thirteenth of October, twenty twenty two. Dear Kim, dear Kate, I must speak about the wind. There's a gusty wind from the northwest, the kind that forces pedestrians to hold their hats close. In the Yukon River Valley, far upstream of where the Klondike spills in, a clear stripe alongside the silty flow. The kind that chills only the very outer layer of skin. The wind owns this valley, and somehow I forget that in the stillness of the trees where I live now. But the sun cuts through sharply, creating an odd sensation of warmth and chilliness at the same time. Why am I so drawn to instruments, so unwilling to rely on my own senses? What is the difference between climate and weather? The weather has turned. We've had three days of steely gray with long bouts of driving rain, icy and unforgiving. This time of year, it feels like a race against the weather. I feel we don't really know how to prepare for winter in the city. I will finish clearing the greenhouse. We buy salt, find the shovel, pack away the garden furniture and kids' toys. I will find things to hang up and dry. Put snow tires on the car. I will do things that I've done every day for the past five to six months for the last time, and I might not realize it until weeks have passed. Change the furnace filters. I'll regret some of these welcome others, a soothing finality that leaves space for other, as yet unimagined things. If something is forgotten, a phone call and a credit card can usually fix it. I'll try to imagine a place where the leaves haven't turned. The most profound change for me as the weather grows colder is my relationship with my cat. I'll watch them through the curtain of drips off the eaves for a while, then get to work. Clearly, I occupy a position of great privilege to be able to say that preparing for winter is an afterthought. What do we do with the privilege of being able to choose, especially when it's our culture's actions that are making life unlivable for so many? The unhoused population continues to grow at an alarming rate in London. I live in closer dependence on the weather than many in my community, certainly than in broader Western society, but I'm aware that my life could seem unbelievably insulated, a farmer awaiting life-giving rains from the perspective of the community seeing life-taking floods. I worry about them. I also think of all the hunters hunkering in tents, RVs, and under tarps waiting for a cool, crisp, clear morning. Sure, it's more pleasant earlier in the season, but it's been so warm at night that the early birds risked having their meat spoil if they couldn't get it chilled fast enough. How does one survive even the relatively mild Southern Ontario winters in a tent? So you see, there are so many moving parts, so many possible scenarios. Many of them involve other people who have nine to five jobs. And it's that interface of a life bound to the vagaries of the weather within a clockwork, mechanistic, structured life that is such a clash. Maybe if we only had to operate in one, it would feel different. 
I've been thinking lately about handing out Friday night sandwiches to those who are hungry. 20th of October, 2022. Dear Kate. Dear Kim. Do you know one of the reasons I have always felt safe in the North? We spoke of landslides and other warnings. No hurricanes, typhoons, or earthquakes. Really, the only danger, if one is prepared, is cold, and it's expected. Even that is changing. We may get flooded out yet, and the forest does burn. I was surprised to hear that it has been more wet than cold in Yukon. Changing climate is making this a reality, and our systems are becoming unhinged. Scary, in his words. Should we be worried? What questions, you ask, my friend? What does this mean? Should we be worried? I could have been speaking of the increasingly mild and slushy winters in southwestern Ontario. Remember those frost frosty days in July? The winters of my childhood were filled with giant snowbanks that my mother spent hours building with a single shovel. We tunnel through long after the streetlights had turned on. John just told me he's trying to adapt to believing the forecast this time of year. I remember countless snow days, white Christmases, and at least a week or two of biting cold in January or February. Used to be, it would predict zero or minus one degree Celsius. And if it was clear, we dropped minus five or minus six. Big difference for our plants, obviously. Now we have mostly slushy, dirty, wet, a few dumpings of snow that melt in between. But last night, the forecasters won. No ice on the washbowl by the outhouse or the dog's dish or the many buckets strewn all over the place. Some will say that memory is fallacious. It can't be trusted. Those snowbanks weren't taller, you were just smaller. Well, we cross-country skied regularly here, and you can't do that anymore. The weather is being given a louder voice than it has had in centuries, finally able to be heard over the din of the machine. We definitely should be worried. You were speaking of the fog loosening its hold on the Bay Area. I have family there, you know, but you could have been speaking of the t-shirt weather hikes I did in Whitehorse last week. Yes, I was speaking of fog, which I find quite fascinating, but could have been speaking about any of the other things. Nasturtium still rambling in full splendor along protected fence lines. You could have been speaking of the frostless August well into September of Dawson, Cosmos still untouched in town, the last day of September. The never-ending 20-degree days, the t-shirt weather hikes, the frostless August. The strawberries began to bloom again the last week I was there. All this was accomplished by such rain. The general sentiment was much less mixed than in parts south. Is a ski hill really the best adaptive response to more snow? What about the forests? What about the animals? What kind of feedback loop does this generate? It's unseasonably warm, and God us help us if we aren't all a bit delighted in spite of ourselves. More tourism, more air travel, more carbon emissions, more snow, more tourism, more air travel, more carbon emissions, more snow. I know this is a symptom of global climate catastrophe and could, will, is leading to ecological collapse. I must admit, I won't miss the cold. Maybe a little. Will you miss it while you're away? Versus, it is awfully nice to be able to hike, bike, walk a little longer before winter sets in. Dear Kim, this is precisely the quandary. I'd even say it's the central ethical dilemma of my practice. Dear Kate, observe, witness, take note, record. Describing nature, soils, and letting them describe themselves. 
as in let it be put on the record so others will know which others being described by researchers, me, and describing yourself. Can one conduct research that doesn't objectify? Your motivations are much more grounded in helping those people in the systems and communities you are studying. What does it mean to help communities tell their stories? I suppose if storytelling is helpful, then you have the means to support the people like us, the farmers, in telling our stories, the stories of our relationships to soil. Can one historicize and help communities at the same time? In giving them context, in contrasting them to pervasive cultural myths that lead to damaging relationships to soil. As researchers, we have the aim of understanding. Is objectification always bad? Just because you are studying doesn't mean you are outside. In fact, you try to situate yourself within that set of relationships. An explorer. Will this lead to systemic change? Is that enough for you? I really don't know. I'm curious to see what happens if I change points of view. Who is telling the story? I guess somewhere deep down, I must think so. I wish you clear skies or beautifully streaked ones on your journey, oh adventurer. Next time I'll write, I'll be even further south. A big hug to you and John. Hugs to you and family. Thinking of you often. Much care and thoughts. Lots of love. Lots of love. Your friend. Best. Kate, London, Ontario. Him, Klondike River Valley, Yukon. <laughs>